Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Jens Chapman. Uh, welcome to our STED Talk series, Spine Technology Education Discovery. And the D also includes uh, debate. And uh, we'll have a couple of those today. The topic today is blood loss and spine surgery. And so the spine is obviously an extremely uh, vascular structure. Uh, we have a, a great uh, visiting professor today, Dr. Joseph O'Brien. He's an MD, MPH. I'll introduce him separately later. Um, he graduated at Vanderbilt and at George Washington University and uh, did his residency at Johns Hopkins. And uh, he works at uh, GWU now uh, as an associate professor in orthopedic surgery. And he's going to talk about uh, some of the aspects of blood loss and spine surgery. I'd like to uh, congratulate and thank our corporate sponsor, Baxter Medical, for having supported this. As always, we have a couple of cases on this uh, pre-Thanksgiving, uh, November 17, that show the highs of lows of blood loss and um, how many factors play into this. Uh, so uh, without much further ado, uh, one of our wonderful fellows, Dr. Nathan Pratt, who's going to introduce himself separately, is going to take the lead, and we'll have a debate and discussion about some of the variables. Nathan? Ooh. Pull up my thing here. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Chapman. Uh, yeah, as Dr. Chapman said, I'm Nathan Pratt. I am one of the fellows here at Swedish, uh, graduate of neurosurgery from the University of Maryland Medical Center. And I'm here today to present a case uh, that we did uh, actually just a few weeks ago. It's 52 year old female, uh, ongoing low back pain uh, for several months. This is actually a follow up appointment at this point. She had seen us several months ago. Numbness, pain, weakness in the right lower extremity in the buttock, posterior lateral thigh, ankle. Uh, she attempted physical therapy, had no benefit. Uh, the symptoms of pain and weakness uh, have become debilitating at this point. Uh, she is noticing a right greater than left side foot drop, fears that she's having increasing risk of falling. Her past medical history, not super exciting, uh, nothing uh, super significant there. Some hyperlipidemia and hypothyroidism, but otherwise not much. Uh, past surgical history, no prior spinal surgeries, and then in terms of her medications and allergies and all that stuff was negative. The most important element to this case is she's a Jehovah's Witness uh, who does not want any sort of blood products. Neurologically, she has full strength in her proximal uh, lower extremities, weakness in her uh, right uh, dorsiflexor, and uh, EHLs bilaterally. Uh, she has sensory loss and sort of an L5 S1 distribution, uh, as described previously, on the right side greater than the left side, and reflexes are absent bilaterally. So here's her. MRI presentation showing severe canal stenosis and a little bit of a spondylolisthesis at L4-5, though that'll be demonstrated more um, impressively in a moment, uh, and pretty bad foraminal stenosis as well. Uh, in addition, L5-S1 uh, had significant foraminal disease, uh, compression of the L5 nerve root, but uh, not a whole lot of central stenosis at that level, but definitely some significant degenerative changes there as well. The most impressive thing here are flexion extension x-rays. So clearly she has a mobile grade one spondylolisthesis, uh, which is uh, likely the primary generator of her back pain. And then clearly her buttock pain is coming from a combination of uh, neural compression and uh, uh, the L4 and L5 nerve roots here and the uh, lateral thigh and leg pain, pardon me. Uh, so, as I said previously, we initially followed this patient conservatively for the obvious reason that uh, despite her young age and relative health, uh, any time where you're worried that there could be blood loss, uh, treating a patient who uh, is a Jehovah's Witness is, is a little bit um, dicey, uh, who they won't receive blood products uh, should you run into an issue. Um, you never know what can happen in terms of hypotension, things like that when people are under anesthesia. We had a lengthy discussion with this patient uh, about the risks of spinal fusion. Unfortunately, because of her spondylolisthesis, uh, this is not going to be amenable to uh, just a decompressive surgery, which would obviously reduce that risk and would most people would be much more confident going at that, uh, even if someone was on a bloodless uh, protocol. Uh, but because of her weakness uh, and because of the increasing loss of function, a uh, decision was to Decide, uh, made to proceed for a L4 to S1 decompression infusion uh, with only inner body fusions being done at L4-5 and just decompressing uh, and instrumenting L5-S1 due to the degenerative changes there and the uh, foraminal disease the patient had. Uh, 
Here's the final fluoroscopy for the case. Uh, everything went very well intraoperatively, no complications. We had uh, an EBL of somewhere around uh, 200 cc's. Um, we did use, and we'll talk about this in a minute, we used Cell Saver, we used TXA. Um, you know, obviously not a huge case, but still uh, the principle was uh, dissection without blood loss, which we'll talk about in a moment too. Clinical course, the patient recovered well. Uh, she was admitted to the floor, had a JP drain that came out on the second day, had relatively low output from that too, uh, and was cleared for discharge to home post-op day two, uh, ambulating. Had some decrease in her uh, mechanical back pain, still some ongoing weakness, um, and is still uh, ongoing physical therapy pending a follow-up at this time. So uh, the keys to this case, obviously, is avoiding transfusion. Um, so... Preoperatively, I should put that at the top. Preoperative op optimization, the patient had hemoglobin greater than 10 uh, coming in. Uh, obviously, a, a significant factor. A patient who already comes in with a hemoglobin of sort of eight or less is, is at a much higher risk of developing a problem intraoperatively, whereas patients who are optimized have less risk of that. Um, and there are a number of ways to go about that, uh, potentially involving even a hematologist, uh, whether or not they'd be okay with something like epigen, depending on how low their hemoglobin is and how uh, important you know surgical intervention is, because they're obviously risk with that type of medication. Um, you know, making sure they're not uh, don't have a iron deficiency or some other genetic issue there. Uh, autologous intraoperative blood uh, reinfusion um, is a technique that's been around for I think over a decade now, um, and some. Patients who are Jehovah's Witness will actually not even accept this. Uh, it needs to be a closed circuit for these patients. Uh, any exposure to the outside elements is considered to be uh, inappropriate and uh, would be a contraindication for them to uh, infuse this. Um, but that being said, uh, that's usually not uh, an issue. It just depends on their particular um, denomination within within the church. This is often a very extensive discussion sometimes with the um, elders. We had a patient like this at Maryland who we literally called the pastor of their church and we're talking to them with the patient and uh, came up with a plan. Be sure to use the right suction when you're using the uh, uh, autologous uh, reinfusion or I mean, in this case, cell savers, the brand, but uh, it doesn't matter which one it is. Uh, don't use the alternative suctions that are going out to the uh, other canisters. Uh, meticulous hemostasis was a key to this case too. Obviously we only lost about 200, 250 cc's uh, and our drain outputs were relatively low postoperatively. So not just intraop, but as you're closing, making sure that you're not having extensive blood loss either, because even if this is coming out the drain, the patient could still require uh, transfusion after surgery. And then the use of tranexamic acid or TXA this blocks plasminogen uh, turning into plasmin, uh, which inhibits uh, thrombolysis. This is not necessarily a thrombogenic substance. It's just a inhibitor of thrombolysis. So the clots that form can't get broken down. It's not causing new clots to form necessarily, uh, which is a little different in action from um, some of the other products that, that, that might be used uh, in other situations. People worried about um, uh, hemorrhage. But uh, anyway, that is all I have credits for the uh, images that were used, uh, papers there, uh, and we'll take questions. So this is a great case to show how everything can be done uh, well mm -hmm. um, in a small elective case where all the variables can be mm -hmm. not just uh, assessed, but reviewed and discussed iteratively beforehand. And obviously there's a conflict of values there where a patient will usually say, I will choose my death and demise over a, a potentially life-saving transfusion. Yes. And there's an undeniable conflict of values that's hard to do. Um, so I'll start with uh, Dr. Hart, maybe. Um, so preoperative EPO, that was a big hope uh, like two decades ago uh, when blood doping in the Olympics became exposed increasingly uh, and somehow became a non-factor because... Uh, long distance athletes uh, had blood clots and died in some cases. So is EPO still relevant? Uh, why, why not? Well, uh, if it's relevant, uh, I've missed it. So I'll say that it's uh, not something that's in my wheelhouse. And I know it was uh, that and also autologous blood donation, right? Have both kind of fallen by the wayside. That was something we used to do for every 
elective total hip replacement uh, back in the day and, um, you know, didn't turn out to really make much difference. And, and I think, you know, the issue, as you touched on issues of safety from the blood supply have uh, really been kind of uh, uh, resolved. I think that's mm -hmm. been a big part of why those other, you know, the desire for other techniques is there's a little less pressure, I think, than there was back when there was concern about contamination in the blood supply. Um, Rod, IV uh, iron, what's the problem with that? We used to do that quite a lot also. Is that falling by the wayside? I mean, I think we do it if you have enough time, like several months in advance. I think mm -hmm. it takes a long time for the body to kind of um, produce red cells from iron. Now, this was an idealized case. Uh, this is done from a single open posterior approach. Yes. Uh, review one more time the blood loss on the patient. Um, what was lost roughly? Around 250 cc's. I think they, they didn't give her back much from the uh, autologous. I think they did retransfuse something of the 25 to 50 cc's, but they didn't cap. I mean, we captured everything we had, but oftentimes what's reinfused is nowhere near what you would think it would be just from what we lose in the case, but it, it was a minimal blood loss surgery. Rod, you're a one of the pioneers of uh, exlif, so far lateral procedures. Can you actually save blood uh, loss by putting these cages in from the side instead of coming from the back? Um, I mean, you do lose blood when you're doing lateral, but it's significantly less. So I think it is a good potential opp opportunity on cases where you're trying to save blood. We had a... We had a case when I was at Maryland at the VA mm -hmm. where we wanted to do that. We wanted to go lateral and anesthesia actually told us no, not because they thought blood loss would be more, but because they were worried a catastrophic injury would be non-recoverable, basically. Yeah. You, know, you, you get a cave injury, you get an aortic injury, and they're just yeah. Dead. So that's but an important point. If there's something that, that goes sour point. with a lateral yeah, that's, procedure. If it goes um, well, it's great. Yeah, exactly. It's perfect, actually, if it goes well for this indication. You know? So with so, MIS surgeries, um, what do you think, uh, you've done MIS surgery at mm -hmm. the University of Maryland. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think the difference of blood loss would have been hypothetically, 200 cc's versus what with MIS for an L4 to S1 fusion? Maybe 50 cc's. I mean, it would have been less, uh, at least from our experience, even with sort of even doing a world C and things like that. It's just not a super high blood loss procedure. Whether or not that would have even made a difference in this case is unclear. You know, I mean, the patient did well either way. Uh, and you can get certainly likely a better arthrodesis doing this. Um, so, I mean, it, it would have been less, but would it have been enough less to say it must be done? I don't know. Great. Uh, all right. Um, we have Dr. O'Brien on now. Dr. O'Brien, this was a case of an L4. Can you flash the images up again? Dr. Which, O'Brien, can you hear us and can you give you us a... This one? A, yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, so we did a thank you. This was a Jehovah's Witness patient who refused any form of transfusions so except at cell saver. We did a conventional posterior open L4 test one decompression fusion single level inner body for a grade one spondy uh, collapsed L5 S1 disc with L4 S1 decompression. Um, the total blood loss was 200 CCs. Patient left post operative day one. What? blood loss, incremental blood loss decrease, could you have offered this patient with an MIS surgery? Great question. Uh, and thank you for uh, having me, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so you said the blood loss was 200 milliliters? Uh, yeah. Two uh, independently verified. Our anesthesiologists have this docusys system, which kind of tracks everything. And Celsius was used, I think, I don't know what was returned, 20 cc's, yeah, 30 not much, cc's, 20, something like that. It was like, I mean, they gave it back just because of her condition. But. Yeah. So a couple of comments. Um, I, the publications I've read on Cell Saver indicate its efficacy is best when it's over uh, 800 milliliter blood loss. Uh, some publications also suggest that most of your blood loss during posterior spine surgery occurs with interbody work, uh, you know, whether that's PLIF or TLIF. And so... Um, in uh, a case where transexamic acid is used and um, anesthesia is cognizant of the issues of blood loss and ad adjuvant agents for blood loss are used, such as um, irrigating bipolar, whether that's a branded uh, device or whether that's a standard irrigating bipolar, you can achieve low blood loss, uh, such as 200 milliliters, which is basically not enough to require any transfusion. 
for less invasive type approaches, um, you can whether that's a minimally invasive T lift or whether that's a uh, uh, lateral inner body fusion, either anti psoas or trans psoas and percutaneous screws, you can routinely see blood loss of about 50 milliliters, and that's independently verified. Neil Anon published a great study uh, comparing blood loss on open versus less invasive surgery for multi-level cases. And what he found was that his blood loss was, on, was under 200 milliliters for some of these multi-level cases compared to much more. And so I think that this is a fantastic case that could be done either open or less invasively. And I think the result speaks for itself. Um, and uh, it's, it's a very nice uh, result. And I, I'm not sure you would have made a difference in the outcome doing a less invasive method for the patient because no transfusion was needed and 200 milliliters versus 50 milliliters doesn't impact the patient's physiology. So great, great discussion, Jan, again. Um, uh, uh, before you came on, we had an interesting comment by Dr. Pratt, who's a University of Maryland, so right in your neck of the woods, uh, grad from oh, yeah. They tried to do an ex lift on a um, patient with religious beliefs against transfusions, and the anesthesiologist actually <laughs> shut that down, saying that if there is a vascular injury, this patient would be dead. So they actually wanted to have an open posterior procedure, and I thought that was an interesting comment. Next, we have a different perspective. Uh, yeah, favorite from UCLA. So the other coast is going to talk about a different case scenario. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Yev, uh, one of the Spine Fellows here, uh, going to talk about a, a very different case. Um, the patient in question is a 58-year-old male who uh, developed uh, low back pain and uh, left lower extremity radiculopathy uh, after a fall that happened uh, three and a half months before the index procedure. Uh, patient isn't very healthy, uh, has a, a type 2 diabetes, alcoholic cirrhosis, uh, uh, on and off hepatic encephalopathy, and uh, chronic kidney disease. Um, Per him and his family, uh, he had significantly reduced uh, mobility uh, after his fall for those three and a half months uh, and was uh, subsequently hospitalized several times for, uh, for AKI. Uh, 